Just about everyone has heard of the brand Logitech. They make tons and tons of keyboards and chances are you've typed on one yourself. They also make what's my pretty much all time favorite keyboard, the MX Keys. But in addition to that, they have a lot of experience making mechanical keyboards, mostly with their Logitech G brand, which is a gaming focused peripheral brand. However, now they're bringing those mechanical switches over to the productivity side of the house with the Logitech MX Mechanical. It's a low profile mechanical keyboard targeted at productivity. And I'm gonna explain why I think in the world of low profile mechanical keyboards, this keyboard is the safe bet. First, we'll discuss the physical characteristics. So this right here is the MX Mechanical Mini. It's a 75% keyboard, but they also make a full size model. And the first thing you notice is this is just classic Logitech styling. The black and gray silver two-tone appearance is very classy, would fit in in any work environment, and also looks pretty good on your desk at home. It's got uh, an aluminum top plate around just the top, not around the sides. The sides are plastic going down to the bottom. And though you might think that cheapens the appearance a little bit compared to some other competitor brands, I think it actually looks kind of nice because it creates this really interesting two-tone look, particularly around the top where you can see the Logitech brand and you just get a nice visual there. Around the back, there are some rubber feet to prevent slipping and there are adjustable feet to take you from either the flat setting or eight degrees of a typing angle. I wish that there was two different adjustable angles so that you'd have a little bit more flexibility, but the eight degrees works for me, so I can't complain too much. 47% of the plastics used in this keyboard come from post-consumer recycled plastic, which is awesome. However, the ABS plastic used on the keycaps is not my favorite. It's shiny, it's smooth, it catches your finger oils and makes it feel a little bit worse when you're typing on it than a lot of other keycaps that I've used. I also miss the fact that when thinking about this in the same light as the MX keys, it loses that concave nature of the keycaps. I understand that it's probably not practical in a low profile mechanical to allow it to interface with the switch, but also have that dip down in the middle. But I just wish it was there because when I'm thinking about Logitech keyboards, I think about those keycaps and I really love typing on them. So beneath the keycaps are Logitech switches, I guess. They don't really say exactly what types of switches they are and they don't use the traditional coloring system. So they have a clicky switch, a linear switch and a tactile quiet switch. So I'm assuming those are blue, red, and brown respectively. I chose the tactile quiet, which is of a brown color when you take off the keycaps. I think you're getting a normal experience there with the switches, nothing special. In terms of connectivity, you can connect three different devices via Bluetooth and there is fantastic quick switching between them. You can also connect through the Logi Bolt USB receiver which is sort of the next generation of the unifying receiver. I've got a whole lot of rants and raves about it. I have a video where I go in a lot of depth. I'm gonna link that down in the description. So if you wanna learn about that, go check out that video. For this keyboard, all you need to know is that it uses Logibolt and it does include it. So if you're somebody that doesn't wanna rely on Bluetooth and wants to use that USB dongle, somebody had a great call out in my previous video about the fact that using that USB dongle can allow you to get into your computer's BIOS, whereas a Bluetooth connection will not. So if this is your only keyboard and you need to do that on a custom built PC, that could be critical. But otherwise, those are the key things to think about in terms of connectivity. Now, when you're connecting this device, it does work with both Mac and PC. There is a tendency for Logitech to make some Mac specific versions, but generally speaking, all of their PC versions work with both. And this one actually does a really good job of working with both. It does have one set of common keycaps that have both the Windows and Mac keys. And so you're not going to be swapping out any keycaps. You just have to look at both depending on which one you're using. But the cool thing is that you don't need to flip a switch in the back when you're going between Mac and PC. So you can seamlessly switch between one and the other without really having to do anything other than changing the connective input. Now to talk about key layout, I really want to highlight the function row and the function key. So if you saw my MX keys review, I spent a lot of time talking about two major gripes and that's the function row being offset and also the function key being on the right instead of the left. Now on the MX mechanical, there is 
a fix to one of those problems. So the function row offset is fixed from the way that I like it. So what you wind up with is the function keys directly over the number keys rather than having them at an angle. And based on the amazing comments on that video and people explaining what they're used to, it really seems like it's a pretty 50-50 split in terms of who likes what. And the more I thought about it, I realized that if you're coming from typing on a laptop or if you're switching back and forth between a laptop and a keyboard, having them more aligned is gonna feel more natural and be more likely to align with what you're typing with on the other device. But if you're somebody that's used to a full-size traditional keyboard, you're used to those function keys being in little like groups of four and kind of spaced out across, which definitely makes them offset from the number keys. So think about what you're used to and whether this would bother you for for me, I switch between typing on a laptop and typing on a keyboard pretty regularly. So having that offset bothered me and having them back in line makes it just a lot more efficient for me to use the function keys. Now down to the function key on the bottom. In this case, on the MX Mechanical, it's still on the right side. However, I'm not that mad about it because these are mechanical switches and I started to look at the left side between the spacebar and the end of the keyboard and really thought about, is it possible to fit four mechanical switches in there? And I don't think it really could happen. You'd wind up with keys that would basically have to be the same size exactly as your switches, and you'd wind up with a really cramped setup over there. On the MX Keys Mini, they do manage to put it on the left side, but I think they were only able to accomplish that because they weren't using mechanical switches. So in this case, I understand, I give them a pass. I still wish it was on the left, just functionally, but it's okay, they're mechanical switches. This is probably the layout you're gonna see across the board on all low profile mechanical keyboards. And now everything we're discussing here comes in at $150 for the mini and $170 for the full size. That's expensive. When we're talking about low profile mechanical keyboards, you can get a really good one a key crown, something like that for just under $100. So all of a sudden you're talking about 50% or more over that price tag. And that's a lot of money. So we're gonna talk about what makes the keyboard unique and special, and then some of the problems and challenges and things that I don't like about it. And that'll help us figure out whether that $150, $170 is worth it or overpriced. So let's start by talking about the things that make this keyboard unique. The first unique thing to talk about is the sound of the keyboard. So let's do a typing test so that you can hear it. Now the sound of this keyboard I find to not really be overly clicky sounding. It's not really like a nice, satisfying, thunky type sound. It's really just falling flat somewhere in the middle there. It's not too loud, not too quiet, but there's just nothing remarkable about it. The thing that I do find remarkable is the consistency across the device. So when I tested some keyboards, like the Keychron in particular stands out, there was a lot of variability in volume between the keys up at the top and the keys down at the bottom. And somehow they avoid that because almost every key on this thing is very, very similar. And even when you get to the larger keys that sometimes have dramatically different sounds than your smaller keys, they're pretty similar too. And it makes for a nice cohesive experience. So even if the sound isn't fantastic, even if the sound isn't anything special, you aren't hearing a bunch of different sounds as you're typing, you're just hearing one nice consistent melody throughout. And that is nice. The next unique thing is the backlighting. Now this does only have a white backlight, but what you're gonna get on this that you don't get on any other keyboard that I'm aware of is proximity sensors. And this is the same technology that was on the MX keys, but basically you present your hands to the keyboard and the backlight turns on. Now this is a little bit of a double-edged sword because it does mean that you just show up and the light's there, but it also means that there is no way to keep the lights on permanently. And this is a big frustration for some people that like to have permanent backlight on, have their keyboard be lit all the time. You don't have that option here. It's there when you're using it and off when you take it away. The benefit though is that 
this saves battery life. And battery life is the third thing to talk about because this keyboard manages to do a fantastic job with the relatively small battery that it has. So it's only 1500 milliamp hour battery, but it somehow outlasts most of the competitors. In my testing, I rarely had to charge this thing. It advertises 14 days of use with backlighting on, and with backlighting off, you can go almost a year, which is just absurd. And then on top of that, there's fast charging. So basically, if you plug it in for 15 minutes, you can use it for a day. So even if you get to your keyboard and it's dead, you just plug it in for a little while and you're good at least for that day. So there's not a lot to complain about when it comes to battery life, and I think that dynamic backlighting is one of the main reasons. The fourth thing to talk about is the Bluetooth technology. It just feels like Logitech has another level of Bluetooth, like they've figured something out that is better than what we're getting in all of the competitors' keyboards. It connects quicker, it reconnects quicker, it changes devices quicker, it's somehow always there always ready to go, even though it's saving battery better than all of the competitors. So it, it blows my mind how they do it. I don't really understand technically. I don't know if there's other companies that are cutting corners or if they've just got some IP in these things that they've figured out that other people can't use, but the Bluetooth connectivity on these are fantastic. The last thing that makes this keyboard unique is the software that's available for it. So you can download Logitech Options Plus, which is the software that works with this particular device. And what it does is it allows you to remap your function keys, to change certain settings, do various things like that. But some of the stuff that makes it interesting and unique is the fact that you can actually do program specific changes to your function row. So if you want a function key to do something in Excel and then something different in PowerPoint, you can do that. And if you have a Logitech mouse as well, you can connect it as well and change the settings there for both devices. There's even a software feature called Flow, which is a really cool one where you can have pairing to multiple devices. You log them into the Logitech software and you can bring your mouse from one device to the other. It's not something that I've found a ton of use cases for, but it's one that's super cool. You can even copy something from one computer, move your mouse over to the other and paste it there. So if you have a workflow like that, that requires you to work on multiple devices at once, then it's really interesting and very compelling. But if you are just operating on one device, a lot of these won't go used. Another consideration is that a lot of times software like this can be blocked if you're on a work computer. My current employer blocks me from using it. So that's why I find it really important what keyboards come with out of the box. So making sure that you like the default function keys and make sure that that function row is useful for you because not everyone has the ability to change it. And also not everybody wants to put extra software on their computer. So I think overall the keys on here are all right, but we're gonna talk about a couple of them in my concerns and problems section. So let's jump into what makes me a little bit concerned and some of the stuff you gotta look out for with this keyboard. So when we talk about problems, the first thing that comes to mind for me are a few different small ones. So the first thing to think about is the fact that you have the F1, F2, and F3 as the way that you change between devices. And on most other low profile mechanical keyboards that I've had, it's one, two, and three, not the function. So that takes away three of your function keys from doing some other feature. That just shrinks the number of keys that you have. And then on top of it, you've got some just useless keys. I don't know why we need to have a dedicated key on a keyboard for emojis. There's also one that does smart assistant stuff and called it out in one of my other reviews. So I gotta call it out here. I hate smart assistants on computers. You know, does anybody use Cortana? I don't think so. So there's function keys that aren't that useful and then they're missing some. So in terms of media controls, you have play pause, but not forward and back. And so let's take out those garbage ones that nobody needs and put in useful ones like media controls that pretty much everybody will use at some point. In addition to that, there's just white backlighting. And so if you're an RGB fan, you're out of luck here. There's no IG RGB version, there's no features like that. On this model, they did include some different lighting features so you can have it you know, go across and light up after you press the key and just gimmicky things like that. So they tried to get a little bit closer, but they're still not doing RGB on these productivity focused ones. They're saving that for their G series where they've got the gaming focused stuff. 
My next issue with the keyboard is the typing experience. So I already talked about the sound, but let's talk about what it's like to type on this keyboard. Compared to the other low profile mechanical keyboards that I've used, and then especially compared to something like the MX keys, there is a lot more actuation force needed to get these keys to press. And I don't know if that's unique to uh, the tactile version that I have, and maybe a linear would be fine. For whatever reason, I find that I have to press down much harder on these keys than I do on the other keyboards that I have. And it just makes it a little bit harder to type. It's harder to be fluid because when you're pressing down more and doing more with each keystroke, it's hard to then get your hand and your fingers over to where the next keystroke needs to, needs to be. It's still not unusable, and if you're somebody that has pretty forceful clicks to begin with, it's nice, but in terms of a typing experience, it's not the best for me. The next problem is that this keyboard is wireless only. You either need to use Bluetooth or you need to use the USB dongle, but there's no wired functionality. So yes, you can leave it plugged in, but it's not going to be a wired connection. So if you have your computer far away and you can't get a signal, that's gonna be a problem. You can't run a long cable and have it work as if it's connected directly. It's just not there. And so that's a really big miss in terms of features on this keyboard because with pretty much every other low profile mechanical keyboard you find, you get the option of either doing Bluetooth, in some cases also having USB dongle, or just doing a wired mode. And so without that, there's kind of a gap there for certain people in terms of their use cases. Now that brings me to my last sort of closing thought around problems, and this is a big one. This is around Logitech as a whole and something that I didn't really connect the dots on until this product. And for better or for worse, I think that Logitech is operating more and more like we see Apple operate. So Apple gets you into their ecosystem. They entice you with the way that things work very well together and play very well together. But they try to keep you in their walled garden by ensuring that you have everything you need there and that you would never need to go elsewhere or else you're gonna have a degraded experience. And also Apple is notorious for having the we know better, like you don't want that feature, we've got it this way, it's the, it's the right way. And I see a lot of that with this keyboard. So the fact that you can't do a wired connection is sort of weird. Like why, why wouldn't they just add that as a functionality? The fact that the key switches are unbranded, unlabeled, and don't follow the traditional way of naming things. You could argue it's for simplicity and so that anybody can understand what they're getting rather than just having a color, but it's also confusing because there are industry standards across mechanical keyboards and they're sort of bucking that trend and using their own naming. Then you've got all of the software features that are great, but then you're all of a sudden stuck with buying a Logitech mouse and having a Logitech keyboard with it and making sure you have that software downloaded and blah, 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 blah. Before you know it, you're really deeply integrated into their ecosystem. Now, there's a lot of benefits to it, so it's can be a good thing, maybe you see it as a great thing, but I wanna make sure that you think about it in that way. And if you're somebody that likes to be a little bit more fluid and dynamic and likes to have a bit more control, then maybe Logitech's not the brand for you and maybe you should look at some other brands like an ASIO or a Keychron or a Nufi. And I've got reviews on all of those different keyboards so that you can check those out and make sure you find the one that's right for you. And so this brings me to who is this keyboard for and why did I call it the safe bet? And I think that's because it's a really great keyboard. It's definitely for somebody who is a Logitech loyalist. It's definitely for somebody that already has that fantastic Logitech mouse and loves the options software and wants to make sure that they all work together and that you get all of those benefits. But it's not for somebody that wants to explore and wants to try something new and wants to go outside of that. It's a really good keyboard, but it's also really expensive. And so are you willing to pay extra for something that potentially locks you into an ecosystem and that might be lacking some of the features that you want, like wired connections or better key switches or better keycaps or whatever that may be. And so I think that if you're just looking to dip your toe into the mechanical keyboard space, and especially if you're already a Logitech customer and in that situation, it's a great keyboard. You're gonna have a fantastic time. You're gonna love using it. But 
when it comes to the whole breadth of low-profile mechanical keyboards out there, it's certainly not a daring choice. It's just a safe bet.